Hello, everybody. Bo Billington with Finding That Next Gear. Got Josh Sweeney here. Josh, super excited for you to join, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, I'm excited to be on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so so we've known each other for probably about a year now. Uh, we met at an entrepreneur group, um, which, of course, is comprised of entrepreneurs. And so I know that you're like an entrepreneur through and through. But you know, the purpose of today is really kind of talk about you, your background, um, you know, how folks take a company from like ideation and inception to like scale and and maybe actual sale, uh, which is something you've yeah. done. Um, so super, super pumped to have you on, man. Thanks so much for joining. Awesome. I'm ready. Yeah. So so currently you've got two companies, my understanding. So Founder Scale, which I'm quite familiar with, as well as Epic Culture. Uh, and you actually had an exit in 2016 of a CRM uh, professional services company that I believe you know stood up um, sugar installations. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Now, how do you have time to have two two different companies to run? Um, talk to me a little um, bit about that. Yeah, so I've actually kind of shut down the Epic Culture side. So okay. I decided that you can't run two companies. Okay. Uh, I don't, you know, at least I, I can't. You know, Elon Musk can maybe, but maybe. there's more capital involved there. Um, so yeah. yeah, so I'm I'm 100% focused on founder scale and mm -hmm. that organization, and just have a strong belief in in focusing in one area. Um, sure. So I've been doing that. Yeah. It's funny, like as I've gone, as I've gone through my entrepreneurial, um, you know, life cycle, I guess I, I've I've found as as well that you can spread yourself too thin, especially with like shiny object syndrome, which is something that I get. Right. Um, I'm trying to find focus in my in my own life, so I can totally appreciate that. So tell us a little bit more about you, kind of, you know, what do you do for your current organization? What does Founder Scale do? Uh, let's dig into that a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, sure. So companies Founder Scale, and we help businesses go from founder revenue to scalable revenue. So if you look at most owners, founders, entrepreneurs, they generate the majority of the revenue in their organization. And at some point they get to a point where they want to scale up and not be that primary revenue generator. They want to have an exit one day and the multiples are a lot better if you're not needed and your, your business, business is still closing deals without you. And yeah. There's all kinds of reasons a founder wants to scale up. And so uh, we found that a lot of people try to hit the easy button and do lead generation services and work with agencies Mm -hmm. And those all have a purpose, but they're not purpose built to help the founder grow from founder revenue to scalable revenue. And so we have a framework that we've put together that mm -hmm. really helps us be the guide along that journey. Um, so that's that's what Founder Scale does is we're the guide along that journey. Understood. So a company's essentially outsourcing, like I guess maybe like the SDR function, uh, sales development representative, BDR, yeah. et cetera. Is that kind of a, a component to the whole? Operate. Yeah, that can be a component. Um, and it's ebbed and flowed over the past two years. So this company is only two years old. Um, it was started after my last exit. And uh, we found a different combination where recently we found a much better product market fit where we're actually coming on as a fractional CRO. <clears throat> and then we're at, and we're looking at it as sales and marketing together. And wow. we're becoming that guide that's staying on with the company for much longer periods of time. And uh, when we do that, we also get the opportunity to provide some of the other services based on the budget and the needs of that client. So really, we we poise our, uh, promote ourselves more as a revenue agency where we're looking at sales and marketing as one cohesive unit or a revenue team. Got it. That makes sense. And then what's your, your target um, customer from an ARR perspective? Like who are you going after? Any industry specific? No specific industries, mostly that they're founder led. I would say it's anybody with what we would call a considered purchase. So they, you know, somebody who wants to make a purchase, but wants to talk to a salesperson. So we do get some B2C, um, sure. but it's normally a more expensive B2C purchase where they're not just pulling out a credit card. Um, we work with a lot of B2B professional services organizations. That's probably 80% of our clients are professional services related organizations. Um, and the sweet spot for us is really somewhere around about between two and 20 million in revenue. So we have some on the smaller side that we can help out with some different packages. We have some on the higher side, but that two to 20 million really seems like the sweet spot where, you know, that, that founder or founding team is really having this challenge and, and they're looking, sure. to, you know, grow from there. Yeah. And then of course I would imagine, you know, 20 million plus, they're probably going to bring all that in-house majority of the time. Um, yeah. So. There's just a lot bigger budget to go get more, you know, a fractional or even full-time. I mean, at 20 million, you're getting maybe a full-time CMO, CRO, sure. you know, things like that. So there's just, there's just more uh, budget for those types of things. Understood. And so let's talk a little bit about you and how, how is you, what do you do currently for your organization? Are you the face? I mean, I know that you do some consulting still, but how has that evolved over the last two years as you guys have continued, you know, your, your, your journey and, and the scale that you're going through currently? 
Yeah. So my goal is, like you said, to be the face. So I'm really head of sales and marketing as, as well as being the president. So um, I've really built up a good team on the operations side. And that was one lesson learned in my last company was, um, you know, I never quite had the team where I wasn't, didn't have a foot in both sides. And I knew that for us to scale, I had to go find the operational people, you know, the people on the operations and delivery side that when I closed a deal or when our sales team closed a deal and, and signed the SOW, we could hand it off and know that that client's taken care of. And so that's a journey. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying we've we've finished that journey, yeah, um, sure. but it's definitely front of mind where the majority of my time is on the sales and marketing side of the house. Yeah, and it's funny how that that, that evolves as well. I mean, I, I'm going through something similar myself where I've, I've always had my hands. It's been a little bit tough for me to pull back a little bit. Um, and over the yeah. last year, that's what I've been working on myself is, you know, like, how can I take care of sales through the face of the company, but then bring in somebody from operations capacity that can, you know, take business once it's been closed, kind of through the process and actually deliver. Uh, and it's easier said than done because, you know, a lot of oh, entrepreneurs, yeah. imagine you're the same, but like, this is our baby. And like my work product is very, very important. And it's it's been a little difficult to relinquish some of that control to other people within my organization. Yeah, we've definitely gone through different rounds and iterations of like, how do we report up on the quality of that work? How are we checking in with clients on the quality, right? And monitoring that so that, you know, you do feel comfortable signing a scope and turning it over to your team and and knowing it's taken care of. Right. Um, And then, you know, and and the smaller the company is, the harder that is, because if one person churns, you know, sure. you're, you're kind of, you could be back to square one, you know? So those are just the challenges that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs we work with have. And, and I think that's kind of the unique differentiator for us is we really, truly understand mm-hmm. that we're not, you know, some large company telling them these things will work for you and completely devoid of, of the facts that they could, they could churn one person that changes the whole game for them and, and messes things up. So there's a certain reality to that for entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, no, totally, totally. Um, it, it's again, it's all, it's continuously in flux and it's been an interesting journey, both uh, high yeah. highs, low lows, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, that being said, how long have you been an entrepreneur? I mean, so you've, you've had, from what I understand, maybe three companies, but I would imagine probably a couple more. You've already had yeah. it. Your goal here is to exit. Like, talk to me a little bit about about you and and you know your, your personality. Why you love entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I've ha- I have had a few companies. Um, <laughs> I've had probably I guess three that you know made it into the six figure territory. You know, two into the seven figure territory, um, and then you know there's just those have been through various iterations as I was growing as an entrepreneur and a founder. Um, I feel like I've always been at least very entrepreneurial, uh, just not growing up with a whole lot. You know, it was, uh, I remember, you know, when they did the fundraisers as a kid, my mom would hand me the box, you know, the chocolate box of the candy bars and back, you know, way back, they were a dollar a piece. I'm sure somebody has a story where they were 35 cents or something, but for us, I think they were a dollar, you know, and it wasn't like my parents were going to take that bucket, you know, that box to work and sell them. They were like, here, go knock every door for the next three neighborhoods. You know, and so when you learn to do that at seven years old, I guess, you know, there's there's a little bit of sales spirit in there. Yeah. Um, and then once you start making the money off of it, you know, cutting lawns and other things like I did and, and seeing the reward, that probably was a big part of the the spark. Yeah, no, definitely a, a light bulb moment for most. And, and I, I myself kind of have always been entrepreneurial and always wanted to start a company, never came up upon the right idea until, you know, 2017. I, that's a whole different story. But, you know, I'd love to hear about kind of, you know, your, your most recent company. Um, and h- how did you determine product market fit? How did you know there was a need for the solution with founder scale that you brought to the table? Yeah, I feel like it, it's interesting, the product market fit conversation, because, I mean, I've always been in professional services uh, with add-on software and enhancements and other IP that we do, we, you know, we build for our client or we build for us to serve our clients. Sure. Um, but the product market fits a really interesting thing in that, um, at least for this company, I feel like we only hit it about three months ago. Right. Uh, so when we started it, the, the crux of it was I had, and backstory is in my last company that I grew to a few million and sold, we had spent, I had spent over $300,000 trying sales and marketing tactics that didn't work for our size companies, right? So think the SEO, the ads, the hiring the salespeople, the meeting setters, the agencies, like we went through the whole gamut, right? Just 
just burning up money. And this is over years, right? So you try something, you recoup, you try something else, you recoup. Mm -hmm. And um, after selling that, I was just like, there has got to be a better way. There's got to be a way where somebody is really candid and says, that doesn't work for those size companies. I don't care what everybody's telling you because they're trying to close a deal and, and sell you on something like what's reality. And so we really embarked on that journey with founder scale of providing different services, uh, you know, sales and marketing services and diving down and deciding what works, what doesn't and why, and being able to back it up, right? I mean, backing it up with data, backing it up with stories and examples. And uh, about three months ago, I feel like we really hit a point where the services we provided, the combination and how we package it, um, hit that product market fit. And then the pitch that we had um, people were just raising their hands and being like, that's me. So for example, I was just speaking at the Inc. Founders uh, event the other day and I'm on a panel and I get off the panel and like five minutes later, I get a lead. You know, somebody raised their hand and was like, that's me, that resonated. Right. And so I think that was where I really felt like we hit product market fit where people weren't confused or asking like questions from confusion. Like, well, what's this? What's that? And it's like, you could tell there was just, you had to do too much explaining. Absolutely. And now, you know, it doesn't feel that way. People just opt in and say, that's the problem I have. I want to go from founder revenue to scalable revenue. I'm the main driver of revenue. I, you know, I need help. I need somebody on this journey. And um, so the way that we packaged it up was just uh, fundamentally different than what we did for the past year and a half. Yeah. Part of market fit is, is, is very fickle, you know, and, and I feel there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it is and, and, and what it's not. And I'd say most companies, it's an iterative process. Like you may have something yeah. that's sellable, but it really, I mean, it's, I've been in business for six years and I feel like just within the last year, product market fit is, is really aligned stories, compelling and people get it or they don't get it, which is totally fine. But it, it really does take a while to kind of hone in on what exactly it is that you're selling. You know, how can you distill that down to something that's very, very easily digestible by somebody yeah. that a third grader could understand. Um, and it, it takes a, a lot of reps. Like I, I don't, most companies <laughs> right. don't figure out product market fit and then go, go sell their product. You know what right. I mean? Like when I jumped out for six months, I worked on this, which made me zero money. And so I had to pivot and it's been a series of pivots along this six year road that have kind of led to where we feel the, the, you know, the scaling is really, really happening, which is, which is exciting. But yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy how it sometimes just clicks and then you're like, we get it. I get it. We're there. So congrats. Yeah, thank you. It's been a it's been a fun journey, you know, and I've had different, you know, different companies with different services, but I would say that's a a really rewarding place to be where it's like this can really help, you know, yeah. other founders get there, save them a lot of pain and headache and money and um, you know, just help them along the way. So, sure. yeah, product market fit's been a big big piece of that. Yeah. Well, let's look at a little bit to the plight of the entrepreneur here. And, and I'll let you I'll let you choose your own journey. OK, so I know you've already, you've already had an exit, which I would imagine there's some juicier details there. Right. Um, but I'll allow you to kind of um, dig in here where, where you'd prefer. But like, what was your situation prior to founding, you know, one of your most recent companies? Because I, I, I know you, you married, you have, you have children. Yeah. Um, that can be difficult for entrepreneurship. Like I used to joke that barometer of success for me is if I'm still married in five years, you know, I like right. that too, and but your like, kids still like you. And yeah. You and my kids still like me. They, they, <laughs> stay, they know who I am. Right. And, right. and far, I think I've, I've, I've done okay. Yeah. Um, what was your situation? I mean, were you in corporate America prior? Did you just get fed up and jump out? Um, did you have to have a hard conversation with your spouse? Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Cause I feel like most people that they, they don't, yeah. they don't really get, to pull up the covers and see what it's really like. Cause it could, it could be difficult, man. I didn't make, I didn't make any money for six months. Zero. Right. That's not, that was, that was not fun. That was very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it's gone through a, a number of iterations. So I started off in, uh, you know, I won't go through the whole journey, but I started off in telecom and my first, mm -hmm. my first uh, job was uh, my first business was in infrastructure, wiring, cabling, all this type of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, fiber optics. And, um, that was my first six figure company. And one day I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. Like I'd been doing it since I was 13 and, wow. um, you know, on nights and weekends and stuff and had the opportunity to do that and, uh, made great money, but I'm like, I don't want to be on a ladder. I don't want to be on a construction site. And I'd always had a passion for information security mm -hmm. and had, um, you know, just had a passion for that through high school and, and some through college. And so I was like, forget it. I'm making a pivot. And I went into information security. 
So I ended up working for a few of the top information security firms uh, here in Atlanta. And that was a great journey. Um, you know, went through that, just that whole journey and um, ended up at a CRM company and as a sales engineer. So again, just kind of another pivot where I was like, you know, I really want to be a sales engineer in information security, but I got the opportunity at a, another tech-based company in CRM space, which was Sugar CRM. And um, mm -hmm. at that point, they actually decided they were going to shut down their entire enterprise sales team and operation, and they were going to pivot the business. And I'm like, man, I'm pretty good at this. You know, I know the sales side, I know the delivery side, you know, I, I'm, I was a top sales engineer. And uh, so I was like, I'll just become a partner. So that was my first seven figure business was, you know, being a sugar CRM partner and part of a, a channel ecosystem uh, in the CRM industry. So just gone through a lot of different changes and, um, you know, different businesses all, you know, around, you know, mostly around sales and technology, uh, definitely technology as a core piece of that, but uh, it's, it's changed over the years. So how long did it take you to find success? I mean, that sounds like the like kind of a home run, right? Where you're you're you know you're working together, <laughs> yeah. then they decide to pivot, but then you've got this skill set, and so you just you just essentially plugged into their ecosystem and right you know, them as a sales channel, and you just work the deals. Exactly. Yeah, we started working the deals and closing them, and uh, so I mean, I guess it depends what success is for each person because it's changed over the years. So like when I graduated or, or while I was in college. Um, you know, I think I, let's see, I got out and started working maybe in information security at the time. And I said, you know, if I'm not making six figures by 25, yeah. I'm going to go back to school. Like I'm going to go see what other degrees I can get. What else do I need to do? And so I think that was like my first success was by 25, I was making six figures and in a job that I loved. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was kind of the first, su first success from a career perspective. Um, and then the second big success was, um, you know, growing at core systems, my consulting firm to a few million and having an exit. Right. Um, so that was a big success. And I think the, the, if you're an ambitious entrepreneur, if you're not content, like I am, you know, some people get, some people are content and I, I appreciate that in them. I don't, yeah. I wish I could be con more content sometimes, sure. um, but I'm always looking for the next challenge. Um, and so the, the second big journey was like, Hey, can I build a second million dollar, multi-million dollar plus company from scratch. Can I do it again? Right. So there's a lot of people who've done it once, but how many have done it twice, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm just moving the bar for myself um, because of mainly for the growth that comes from that. So sure. the growth, the growth is the, the driving factor. Yeah, it's interesting too, how you, you talk about how do you define success and how that continuously changes and evolves. I, I felt the same when I was in college, I got to make X amount, then you make X amount. It's like, okay, well, what <laughs> next? And then to me, it ended up being quality of life was kind of more yeah. important. Of course, money supports quality of life in a lot of situations, but I, I've changed that as well. And over the last six years of my business, I've changed what success looks like year to year. I mean, hell, it's almost like quarterly. I'm changing what that looks like yeah. uh, in, in different metrics, which is fun. Um, well, that, that's, that, that's super awesome, man. They're like, what about, you know, so have you lost, ever lost the love for entrepreneurship? And it sounds like there's times where it's closed. <laughs> yeah. I've been there, but for me, candidly, going back to corporate America is just not, it's not an option. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm much more content here than I've been, but is there ever a time where you thought about hanging it up? I mean, is that, is that why one exits a company? Um, or have you thought about working away from entrepreneurship just in general for, you know, greener grass? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, when when you start a new company and you know, there's no like you said, you're, you're there's no income coming in or very little, right? You're not getting paid. You're not paying yourself maybe at that point at the start of the company what you were getting paid when you were 25 mm -hmm. years old. So you're right. like, "Wait, these numbers don't work." And I was <laughs> I was way further along. Yeah. My income was like this. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, you know, that ebbs and flows. I would think, I mean, there's only been a few instances where, you know, the the passion, you know, changed. Yeah. Um so, you know, had had a started the pat last company had three multiple successful really good years and then we had our first bad year and right. that was like you know how much can you really grind how much stress can you really handle to push through this and so we went and got um quotes or you know estimates and offers to sell the company mm -hmm. you know we were looking at all that and i'm looking at the offers i'm like there's no way i work this hard to only get this far you know, it just wasn't there. And so I just doubled down and then had a great, you know, best year ever after that year, you know, so there's just some hard years that, you know, 
the world <clears throat> tries to break you. <laughs> I agree. It feels like, and and if you don't let it, then oftentimes you know the it's it's darkest before the dawn. You know, uh, sure. you know Renaissance after the plague is is kind of what it feels like in entrepreneurship. No, it, it really can. I mean, when I when I first started, I mentioned I went six months without a paycheck, and then I, I was really grinding a lot at that time. I mean, it was it was early, it was night, most nights, weekends. I mean, just around the clock. And I did that for about six months or so, which you know paid dividends. It, it truly did, but it's not sustainable. I mean, about a year and a half in or two years in, I thought to myself, I don't know if I could ever go back to that dark place that I had to go to to get to get the business to where it needed to right. be out of out of a, a valley. Um, and it, it's 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 really difficult. And I've found in, in that journey and, and kind of this is the premise of the podcast, like how do people find that next year? And, and for me, I think perseverance is one of the biggest traits um, in entrepreneurs. And that separates those the doers from the don'ts. But I'd love to kind of hear what your thoughts are from a trait perspective. Like what 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 inherent traits do entrepreneurs have and what do they need to have in order to really get through the, the tough times? Because it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows. As, <laughs> right. as, you know, I mean, it's right. it's literally the second you think you something great has happened. I mean, generally, like I, I'll lose a client or like something else happens that I've got to fix. It's not all happiness. Yeah, <laughs> I think perseverance is a great uh, way to put it. Uh, another one, you know, I think grit's another one I hear where yeah. it's just like, you know, you just got to grind it out and you have to be able to push through some really trying things and trying yeah. times. And like you said, after you push through that one, a year later, there's going to be another one, you yeah. know, and, and you almost, um, I would say after this many years though, you know, after, I don't know, 12 years in it, you start to get used to it, which it's I think is eerie. Maybe, it's it, eerie, yeah. it's eerie <laughs> but it's good and it's bad. Cause it's like, after a while, you're just like, I know it's coming. I'm just going to push through it like always. Mm -hmm. And I think you're, you're at that point when you can do that, you're at a different level, you know, like you've, you've excelled to be able to get through the bad times and not let it tear you down or anything else or quit. And uh, if you don't quit, you can't lose, you know, the game's not over. No, but, yeah. listen, I, I totally agree. And I, I've noticed that as well. It's like, you know, I, I try to be, you know, like reflect back and, and think, you know, be self-aware. And I've noticed things as well that have happened and happened in the past. And now they don't bother me nearly as much as they would have just six months or a year ago. Um, right. Still, you know, my goal is to, is to sell this business eventually, but you know, I'm still, you know, not sure if I would ever want to start a company from scratch again. Honestly, like I, I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know because it was it was so much harder than I thought it would be. I mean, no brand equity, no funding. People don't know anything about you as a person or your business. Um, and it's it's a it's a lonely world out there sometimes. So that's that's still a question mark for me. But you know, you have a co-founder, and do you think that could be a game changer for for entrepreneurs? I mean, because sometimes it's a good thing, other times it's it's actually a really really horrible thing. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, Cause you know, you hear a lot of the horror stories about co-founders. Um, yeah. But I think there's a lot of things that can be put in place to, it's usually like the first co-founder, right? right? The first co-founder somebody gets is where the horror story comes from. And after that, if they're still open to having a co-founder, then they put the right uh, precautions in place, right? They put the right standards in place, the job descriptions, everything's better communicated. And I think that's where you really get the bigger wins. Cause I've analyzed a lot of different companies, worked with a lot of companies with what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that the ones that grow faster seem to be more stable, get there a little, with a little less headaches. A lot of times you get two and three co-founders yeah. um, that are working together. And I think it's um, it's just interesting to see like how can people work together to get there? And if they don't have a co-founder and are adamant that they can't and the business is stagnating, you start to wonder, well, why is that, right? Are that is that person that hard to work with? You know, so it almost could throw up some red flags as well of like, or, you know, or maybe things are going good where it's at and they don't want to make any more money and, and it's more of a content situation, right? So there's lots of different, uh, areas and I know everybody has their story on that one, but yeah, I'm I'm more the person of leaning towards. I've already grown one the hard way with no co-founders, right. and you know I would so, rather yeah. have a, a a bigger you know a smaller piece of a much bigger pie that's yeah. that's bigger in the end uh, and get there a little with with hopefully less stress if everything's structured correctly. Yeah, rising tide, but it basically sounds like yeah. you need to get burned at least once and then <laughs> lesson learned. 
or but, have good advisors that that give you all that information up front. You know? Yeah, and I, yeah. I've done the same, man. I've, yeah. I've you know found this company and, and grown to where it is currently by myself. I've got I've got a partner now, but like it's tough. It's tough when you're alone. Um, it really yeah. is, you know almost need like a support group. So just a couple more questions, man. I really appreciate sure. your time. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself like one piece of advice prior to starting a company, any company, what would that be? Because I mean, I, I could write a book on the things that I did wrong. Right. <laughs> Um, prior to starting a company, I think I would, um, I would have read and read a lot more yeah. and, and had more mentors along the way. I think, I think being open to seeing a shiny object, going and taking the time to research it and run it by mentors and get more input before you just jump in feet first on certain things yeah. could have saved me a lot of headaches. And there's a lot of people out there willing to mentor. And I don't think I really got to a point where I utilized that until a lot later. Um, and I'm talking about mentors, like people who have done it, you know, somebody sure. with yeah. a, a, that is a founder that's been down that road, you know, that that's providing uh, advice from a place of experience, not from yeah. opinion. Um, so I think that's one is just, you know, a lot more mentorship and, and personal education. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'd say half the folks that I asked that question to either it, it's like a tribe mentor yeah, and the other, um, but that's, that's a great response. And, and I totally agree. I feel like I waited not too long, but like, I wish I got help earlier, but to your point, like not opinion help, but base, but, but help based in facts. So I right. literally has like grown a similar company to mine at a much quicker clip and exited. That's the person I want to talk to. You know, yeah, yeah. All everybody's else. everybody's got opinions, you know. Everybody's and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, tell me a story when you did it and how that worked. That's what I really need to know. When somebody says, "Well, here's what we did, yeah. and it was a disaster," I'm like, that's valuable, <laughs> you know. Like, no, to got it. <laughs> totally. I found myself when I first started. I was asking everybody, like, they were like in corporate America for like 20 years, and I was asking yeah. their advice, and it's like these folks had unlimited budgets, you know, and, and like oh, yeah. Yeah. And mismatch, you know? So at, at any rate, all right. So, so we're going to hit the <laughs> round real quick, just, um, you know, okay. learn a little bit more about you, Josh. So what's your favorite part about being your own boss? Uh, controlling your time. Good one. Yeah. Controlling my time. Agreed. What's your least favorite part of being your own boss? Uh, everything stops with you, right? It's extreme yeah. ownership. You, you own every single outcome. Yeah. That, that's a great response. And I, I feel for me, I think it's like decision fatigue. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll make so many decisions where my wife is like, Hey, where do you want to go to dinner on Friday? I'm like, I, 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 I can't, I can't process. I don't know. You just, <laughs> right. just, just make that something. decision for me, you know, <laughs> right. put it on my calendar. I'll be there. Um, yeah. What's your biggest success? Um, yeah, probably my exit. You know, having yeah. growing a company to a few million and having an exit is definitely a, a pretty big success. Yeah. Well, the flip side of that question is failure. What's your biggest failure? Biggest failure. Um, biggest failure. And if you haven't had any, that's awesome. That's no, okay. I've definitely yeah. have them. I was that's trying to. Yeah, I was waiting too long for that one. Yeah. Um, no, I think my biggest failure is. Um, was really just, you know, trying to biggest failure is like really understanding and motivating people. I had to do a lot of research. I'm very just uh, more engineering minded results, yeah. numbers driven. And yeah. there's, there's a lot of value to the other half, right? The relationship side, um, you know, and, and how you coach and how you deal with people with different personalities and things like that. And so for me, you know, I think my biggest failure early on was thinking it was all results, you know, yeah. pushing really, really hard for just results and leaving, you know, the, the other important pieces on the table. Uh, so that was more of a, just a, a personality trait that I had to learn from. Yeah. Like how do you motivate people? How do you work with people? And and I don't know if that was the impetus for starting yeah. out of culture or, or what, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm finding myself too. Like we did a personality assessment on my team a month ago and it was super interesting. And yeah, it was actually one of my teammates' uh, suggestions, and it's really allowed us to kind of work more effectively with each other because um, we all see the world differently. I'm not super, like, I care about results, but like I, the way I drive is a little bit different than than, than everybody else. Um, yeah. All right. So, hardest part about 
owning your own business. I know you mentioned the buck stops with you, but like, what's the hardest part about having a business? Um, I think the for me the hardest part is is the people side. You yeah. know, it's it's really just you know learning and managing people, their expectations, getting you know getting what the best out of them for the team, having right. them collaborate with the team. And there's just a lot of dynamics to that, right? With with yeah. people's home life and what their career is and what they think their opportunities are. That's just that's probably the hardest part. Yeah, interesting. I'm in the people business and yeah. number one complaint or not complaint, but issue that most companies have is finding the right talent because people are just, they're just difficult. It's, it's super difficult. Yeah. Dynamics, et cetera. I get it. All right. Last question for you. Where can people find you? So you can go to founderscale.com and uh, contact me there. You can also find me on LinkedIn, Josh Sweeney. Awesome. Josh, really appreciate it, man. Congrats on all the success. And um, you know, I've worked with you with Founderscale and, and just a quick plug. Um yeah extreme consultant uh, and I I'd highly recommend your services to anybody out there that needs some help with, uh, with scaling and, and revenue. So thanks awesome. for being on. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you,